All right, let's get into this. Again, a lot of cool stuff to talk about. What I'm gonna do is break this up. We're gonna talk about piers, then we're gonna talk about the beach, and then we're gonna talk about bridges, okay? Because there's a lot that's involved with each of those different venues. Let's start with piers. We know that there's a lot of piers in Florida. You know, locally we've got the, the Dania Pier, Commercial Pier, uh, Deerfield, uh, of course, all the way on up, Juno Pier, all the way Sebastian, and they keep the Lake Worth Pier. Really, the best pier fishing, if you were to ask me, is not in Broward County. Excuse my language, the piers in Broward County suck. Okay, <laughs> they do. And if you've been to these piers, you know that. You've got a bunch of yo-yos on the piers who are catching, you know, they're fishing with that kind of tackle, and they're just trying to catch whatever. And not to say that every now and then you can't catch a quality fish at a local pier, because you certainly can. Guys catch nice snook, some nice kingfish, pompano, but in, you know, day in and day out, Broward County is not the pier king of the world, so to speak. You've really got to go north, okay? Really from Boynton north is where you want to be when it comes to pier fishing. And the further north you go, the better it gets, all the way on up to, you know, for example, Sebastian. Anybody ever fish Sebastian? Okay, unbelievable, the fish that you can catch on that pier. Make no mistake, pier fishing is very technical, but there's a tremendous amount of opportunity. We're not talking about catching fish this big, okay? That's not what we're talking about. You can go out to a pier, you can catch pompano, redfish, snook, black drum, Spanish mackerel, bluefish, uh, permit, sharks. It, it, the list goes on and on and on. Flounder, okay? It, there's so much opportunity at these piers, but you really gotta be dialed in and you really need to know what you're doing. Okay, otherwise you're just spinning your wheels. And I overheard somebody talking about this and they said, you know, I don't like to go to piers because they're so crowded and there's so many people. And you're 100% right. I don't like to go to piers because they're so crowded and there's so many people. But most of those people are where? Where on the pier? They're right at the end. Everybody walks out to the pier and goes right to the end of the pier. And I'm like, what are you doing, dude? You're missing the bite, you know? That's not really the hottest part of the pier. You gotta really think about it. Think about what a pier is. Imagine you've got this stretch of beach, okay? Just featureless beach. And then suddenly there's this giant dock on steroids that's sticking out, okay? Hundreds and hundreds of feet. That's really what it is, right? Hundreds and hundreds of feet. You got this dock that's sticking out. So all of the fish that are moving down the beach, where are they gonna be? Where are they going to stop? They're going to stop at that pier because it's a feeding station, all right? It's structure. There's bait there. And if there's bait there, certainly it's going to attract the game fish that are around as well. Keep that in mind. So you've got to look at that pier like it's a giant piece of structure and you've got to fish it properly. And really, the end is ideal if you're looking for, say, king mackerel, okay? Because you can catch kingfish on piers, maybe jacks, okay? But for the most part, the first third of the pier is where you're gonna have the most action. And really think about it, why? You've got these, tr these troughs along the beach, you know, you've got these pockets of water and the waves are rolling in. And what are those waves doing? They're uncovering, they're uncovering morsels in the sand, crabs and shrimp. So species that are highly desirable, like pompano, redfish, snook, they're not out at the end of the pier in the middle of nowhere hanging out in the wide open water. They're closer toward the shoreline. They're taking advantage of all of the bait that's being exposed. So don't think that you have to be way out at the end of the pier because you don't. That's first and foremost. You absolutely do not. The first third up to the half of the pier is certainly a great place to be. Before you decide where you're going to, you know, set up, Pay attention to what's going on. Walk out to the pier, look around, see what everybody's doing. Scope out the scene, okay? Get dialed in, you know, before you decide, hey, I'm just gonna fish right here. Look around, see who's fishing where. Pay attention to what the wind is doing. Pay attention to the current. Is the, you know, water moving down the beach, up the beach? Do you, you know, see it moving in or out? What the tide is doing? You really have to pay attention to what's going on. It's very technical, it's very important. It's not like, just going out there and throwing a bait anywhere off the pier and thinking you're gonna catch whatever you would like, okay? So pay a lot of attention to what's going on. 
One of the most important tools that you can have when pier fishing is a beach cart. Everybody has seen my beach cart up here. Why? Because when you go out to a pier, you can't say, hey, I'm going to go pier fishing today and strictly fish for pompano. You could say that, but if the pompano bite's not on, you're left high and dry if all you do is walk out with one rod. Okay, so you've got to kind of keep your, your, your options open and say, hey, I'm going to go pier fishing, but I'm going to take advantage of whatever bite is happening at that time. And it may be pompano, it may be redfish, it may be snook, it may be black drum, could be Spanish mackerel and bluefish running around. So you've got to have the right arsenal. And granted, I'm not saying you need to go out with eight rods. I do, okay? But you don't have to, but the more tackle that you can bring, the more prepared that you are, the more successful you're going to be. And it's tough to carry eight rods out to a pier and lean them up against the pier because we all know what happens then, right? Um, at the least, they disappear. So a beach cart is absolutely essential. This is from a company called Platinum Products. Really awesome. Eight rod holders, okay, big fat wheels that make it easy to roll in the sand as well. So an essential piece of equipment when you're pier fishing. You can hold a cooler, obviously a bucket, which is super important. Your lunch, you can use it as a seat, a place to keep your fish. I mean, I can't stress enough what an essential piece of equipment that really is when you're pier fishing, okay? Super easy to carry all of your gear. The first thing that I do when I go out on a pier and when I prepare to go pier fishing is I bring a variety of tackle. The first is a bait rod. Okay, because of course, what's going to be the best bait for you to use at the pier? Live bait. Okay, potentially live bait. If you're going to be bait fishing and not fishing artificials, live bait. Well, where do I want to catch that bait? Right there at the pier. Okay, so how am I going to do that? I bring a little tiny, you know, light rod rated for, you know, whatever, 8 to 15 pound line with a sabiki rig. Everybody's familiar with these multiple hook sabiki rigs. Really, really simple. Okay, now keep in mind, a lot of guys will bring a cooler with an aerator or a five gallon bucket with an aerator and they'll catch their live bait right there at the pier little pilchards or whatever it is that they're catching and they'll keep their bait alive and that's what they'll use an absolutely great option option b if you're going to be bringing your own live bait what's the best bait that you can bring out to a pier anybody by show of hands shrimp everything eats shrimp Everything, everything that swims around a pier eats live shrimp. So if you're going out to try and catch pompano, redfish, snook, whatever it is, if you can get your hands on some big live shrimp, that's an ideal bait to bring to the pier. Some other baits that are really effective include sand fleas, other sorts of crabs, clams, okay, are also an excellent bait to bring to a pier. And of course, cut bait, mullet, ladyfish, things to that nature. But again, it all depends as to what specifically you are targeting. Make sure you have that bait rod, because as I mentioned, if you can catch bait at the pier, that's really, really going to be a big benefit. So the next rod that I'm going to bring is in fact a pompano rod, okay, just a light rod, soft tip, Okay, this is a chaos rod rated for 8 to 17 pound line, matched with a little Daiwa black and gold size 4,000 reel. You can put a 2,500 or 3,000 reel, 10 pound braid, 20 pound fluorocarbon leader, and a little jig. This is called a swivel jig. A lot of people have probably never even seen that before. It's just a little lead ball with a little feathered hook. Okay, that's all that it is. And it mimics a shrimp. Okay, it doesn't even look, I mean, does that look like anything? What in the world? It's just this painted little ball. When I first saw that, I'm like, what the hell is that thing? Okay, I'm never going to catch anything on that thing. But you would be extremely surprised that the pompano will jump all over these swivel jigs. And make sure you bring more than one because guess what, what else eats the swivel jigs? The Spanish mackerel and the bluefish. So, of course, they're going to cut you off. Now, when you're fishing for the pompano, one of the popular species that guys target on the piers, as I mentioned, are not fishing way at the end. They're fishing in that first third of the pier, right where that trough is, where that water is, be, you know, is turbulent and it's exposing the crabs and the shrimp. That's where those pompano are cruising up and down the beach, that first third. You're going to take that swivel jig or even something like, where is it? This is another pompano jig from Buccaneer. It's shaped like a little banana. That's kind of what that looks like. And again, you'll look at that and you'll say, well, what in the world is that thing? What's going to eat that? 
Well, believe it or not, the fi what fish see is different, of course, than what we see, okay? And that, again, mimics a little shrimp darting in and out and right off the bottom. So very simple, lightweight jigs, but You've got to do it right. You've got to have a nice little sensitive outfit. Imagine if I took this rod, okay, with that little jig. Am I going to even be able to cast it? I'm not even going to be able to cast it. I'm not going to feel a bite. I'm, it's not going to be sensitive. And that's what's important is that you're really feeling everything that's going on. You want to feel that jig, you know, bouncing right off the bottom. I want to know at every minute exactly what that bait is doing and to be able to feel every single strike. So it's all about sensitivity, and the rods make a big difference. So lots of options there when it comes to the pompano jigs. Another rod that I'm going to bring is the same rod, the same outfit, pretty much the same reel, same line, but with a spoon, okay? Just a metal spoon with a little piece of wire or a gotcha type of plug. You guys have ever seen those little metal gotcha plugs? And what am I targeting with this? Bluefish and mackerel, okay? Bluefish and Spanish mackerel. You've got to have something that you can cast, obviously. And keep in mind, you know, ironically, sometimes you'll go to a pier. The wind is blowing from the north, so it's blowing down the beach. And you'll see everybody fishing the south side of the pier because they can cast their spoons and their jigs and their lures with the wind much further, right? Does that make sense? And all of the fish are on the north side of the pier. I see a few people shaking their heads. You've experienced this too. All the fish are on the north side of the pier. You can't catch them on the south side of the pier. And you wonder why in the world are they there and not there. But the point is, they are. So you need something that you can whiz in, into the wind, not only with the wind. And again, it's all about balance. I'm not going to take this rod, this seven and a half foot rod, you know, and put a, a six ounce lure on here right? Because what's going to happen? You're going to end up having tackle failure. It's just not going to work out right. So make sure your entire setup is balanced. That's super important. But again, something for those bluefish, for the Spanish mackerel, something with a little bit of wire. You can eliminate the wire and fish a little bit of heavier fluorocarbon, maybe 40 or 50 pound line, and you'll get more bites fishing the fluorocarbon leader than you will fishing the wire leader. But in addition to more bites, what's going to happen? You're going to cut, you know, you're going to get cut off and you're going to lose some lures. So it's a balance, you know, what do you want to do? Do I want more strikes and willing to lose a few more lures or do I want a little bit more security with the wire leader and get a few less bites? That's up to you to decide. But again, so now I'm ready to catch those pompano. I'm ready to catch the bluefish and the mackerel. And if I only had one of these rods, no problem. I can easily switch off, right? It's the same rod, same outfit. I could easily switch off and put a different lure on that rod. But it's nice to be rigged and ready to have a couple of different lures. Next thing I'm going to do, I'm going to have another rod. This is a little bit longer, eight foot, okay, matched to a Daiwa little jig reel, okay, 20 pound braid, a little bit heavier, and this has a bait rig on it. Okay? I'm going to fish this rod. Rather than fishing the lures, I'm going to throw out a couple of baits. And keep in mind, when I fish piers and when you fish piers, how many rods are you fishing? Eight. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Other than our superstar that's fishing eight rods, Okay, ideally you should at least fish two, you know, because you can throw a rod out there with a baited rig and then fish a rod with a jig. Just pay close attention to your baited rod because everybody, you know, or nobody likes that guy who leaves his rods unattended at the pier. You know, nobody likes that guy. You're that guy? They do that a lot. Oh, they do that a lot. Yes, you are 100% right there. Listen, there's no mis- listen. I got to be honest. There's no mistaking it. You go to a pier, you're going to see all different kinds of people. You know, there are some that take it seriously, some that show up with an arsenal of equipment that are there, you know, to do some serious business, to do some damage. They take it very seriously. There's guys that, you know, really are so into peer fishing that it's like a science to them and they're addicted to it. And then you have these other yo-yos that just go out there with a box of squid right and they leave it laying around baking in the sun and they got these heavy rods or they're fishing these little push button things and they don't care they're not attending to their tackle you're going to get all different kinds of people they're, you know you're not going to find a pier that's just suited just for you and that's part of pier fishing it is it's just part of the whole game and you have to just you know play your cards right 
Nevertheless, don't be that guy that leaves your rods unattended, but certainly you can fish two rods. The second rod, real important, very stealthy, okay? 20 pound fluorocarbon leader. I've got a pyramid sinker, okay, that I like to fish when I'm fishing the surf or when I'm fishing piers because when I throw this rig out, I don't want it to move. I don't want it, if I just had an egg sinker or a bank sinker, as those waves are rolling in and out, that whole rig is rolling in and out. And if it's a crowded pier, I'm spending more time dealing with the yo-yo next to me getting untangled than I am catching fish. So I want my rig to be straight out in front of me or wherever I cast it and to remain in that position. So you fish either what's called a Sputnik sinker or a pyramid sinker that really anchors itself into the bottom. Obviously the size of that sinker is going to vary depending on how much wind and current you have, but usually two to four ounces is plenty. Two hook rig, small little stealthy 1-0 VMC circle hooks. That's it. This is a small hook, but it's very strong. You can catch an extremely large fish on this tiny hook. And if you're fishing sand fleas, if you're fishing shrimp, if you're fishing a small fragile bait, do you really want a large bulky hook? Absolutely not. That's going to deter the entire presentation. Remember, this is technical fishing and it's all about stealth and even the small details make a very big difference. So you can see my rig is very simple. It's a high-low rig, two hook rig. That's it. One hook is very close to the sinker right there and another one's a couple feet up above it. Circle hooks, you can throw this out. Like I said, bait it with shrimp, clams, sand fleas. Either of those three baits are going to produce. However, one thing that cracks me up, when I go to a pier and I watch these people and they, they look around, make sure nobody's behind them and they take their rig and they whiz it way out there, right? And it goes, Scott, way, way out there. And I stop and I think to myself, I say, you know, if you were fishing a dock, remember? Because we said a pier is like a giant dock. If you were fishing a dock for redfish and snook, would you cast your rig as far away from the dock as you possibly could? No. Would you do that? No, where would you cast your rig? As close to the dock as you possibly could. Because that's where the bait is, that's where the fish are, that's where the structure is. So I'm not suggesting you should drop it straight up and down, although that's probably not a terrible idea. But don't think that you have to throw this a country mile way out there, because you don't. Okay, you want to fish that vi the vicinity of that that structure of that pier. You know, again, you get these hot shots, these pier rats, kids that go out there with these enormous rods and reels and that, you know, it's like a casting contest. And I laugh because really the only purpose that you would ever do that is if you want to really catch like Bonita or King Mackerel at the pier. So I could see throwing it way out there. But other than that, fish your rigs and fish your bait within the vicinity of the structure because that's where the fish are. That's why they're there. They're there for that structure. So keep that in mind. This too, we're going to talk about when we get to beach fishing, we're going to talk about how a lot of this tackle is universal, okay, where you can use it on the pier and you can use it at the beach and so on and so forth. You can literally take this entire cart and go fish on whatever pier and then roll it off the, the pier and roll down the beach and continue to fish. So that's really nice about this sort of, of venue. But again, a bait rod, super important. And you want something with a little bit of beef, but you also want something that's light, that's comfortable, that's enjoyable. You want to make the most out of these fish that you catch. But remember, a lot of the fish that you catch on the pier, what do you have to do with those fish? You've got to flip them up into the pier, unless you have a big pier net, okay? So you need something that has enough oomph, enough backbone to be able to flip a fish up and into the pier. And understand when you are flipping fish, may it be a juvenile snook, redfish, black drum, pompano, bluefish, Spanish mackerel, whatever it is, and you are flipping a fish and you are fighting that fish, reel that rod tip straight down straight down to the fish. You want to minimize the amount of line between the rod tip and the fish, okay? The fish is right on the surface. You're going to reel straight down, grab the rod. Don't grab the rod back here, okay, and try and flip it. Grab it in a beefy area in one smooth motion up over the rail and onto the pier. Make sure nobody's behind you. You don't want to hit the, you know, Asian lady in the head with whatever you just caught, okay? So be careful there. But again, you need something that's got a little bit of beef, okay? 
Super important. This is probably one of the most important rods and reels that you can bring out on a pier. Next one, Mac Daddy. Okay, now you may look at this and say, wow, that seems like overkill. Really? Really? You think that's overkill? Go to Lake Worth and see a 50 pound jack crushing mullet. Okay, and try and catch that jack on anything less than this. Okay, you need a heavier rod for big, big jacks for sharks. Okay, there's a lot of sharks around the piers, and you can catch these fish on poppers. It's a lot of fun to catch those big jacks on the poppers, but you need something that can handle it. Big Daiwa dogfight loaded with 50 pound braid. Eight foot rod, as you can see, much beefier than those rods, but this is designed for one, pur one purpose. I'm not taking this out there trying to catch a three pound pompano or a two pound pompano with this outfit. I'm trying to catch a 50 pound jack or doing battle with a shark or tarpon. How about tarpon? Let's not forget there's lots of tarpon around as well. So you need something that's a little bit heavier, okay? That you can throw a big popper because there's few things in fishing that are more exciting than watching a big jack chase a popper and crush your popper, okay? Finally, well, I don't wanna say finally, I'm not done yet. Another rod, a little bit lighter, again, a little bit longer because I'm fishing these piers. So they're eight foot rods, as you can see, for the most part, they're longer rods that give me a little bit more flexibility. Okay, with just a swimming plug. This could be anything, okay? There's just any sort of swimming plug. Now you can see in this particular case, you know, just a wrapless swimming plug, but what does this look like? What does that mimic? Mullet. What are the fish eating? Mullet. What are you gonna throw? Something that looks like a mullet, okay? I mean, really, really simple. It's not rocket science, okay? And everything eats mullet. Everything, you know, again, those redfish, the bluefish, the Spanish mackerel, the jacks, the, you know, the snook, everything eats mullet. So certainly I'm gonna have a swimming plug that I can fish as well on the move. Okay, on the move meaning sometimes you do have that privilege of walking around the pier. There's not a lot of people, you know, maybe it's nighttime. And keep in mind, pier fishing is not reserved for just daytime. Some of the best pier fishing takes place at night. There's a lot less people, okay, and the fish are less spooky. And sometimes you can really do well at night. But swimming plug, certainly important. Lots of different options there. There's about 50 different options right here. You know, that's actually what's nice about this seminar. Everything that you need, you can purchase right here at Chaos, okay? <laughs> Let's not forget that. Finally, probably the number one killer of snook and redfish at piers, okay, is this jig right here. Anybody know what this is called? Flare hawk. That's right, just a flare hawk jig. Now keep in mind, what does that look like? Nothing, just looks like a bunch of hair, brightly colored with a funny shaped head, okay? It just, it doesn't look like anything, but it really does look like something because in the water, when you cast this out away from the pier and you swim this jig, and keep in mind, you do not want to bounce this. The ideal way to fish a flare hawk is to throw it out and just reel it really slowly right across the bottom. You want that jig to just creep right along the bottom. And it mimics a crab. A crab or a big shrimp, okay, or even a small bait fish like a mohara or a sand perch. You know, and again, that's what these fish, you know, when we think bait at a pier, we think silvery baits. That's the first thing that comes to mind. Mullet, you know, herring, sardines, goggle eyes. You think of all of these small scaled silvery baits. But there's a whole world of critters down there that are in a different league that are prime forage for these species, like the little tiny jack crevals and the little leather jackets and the moharas and the sand perch, you know, stuff that looks like a pinfish. You know, the stuff that really, and keep in mind, pinfish is another great live bait to take out on piers. So stuff that, the brown stuff, and that's really what this kind of mimics, believe it or not, is those more natural baits, not the fast moving silvery baits. That's what I'm gonna use this for. If I wanna mimic a mullet, I'm gonna use something that looks like a mullet, that swims like a mullet. If I wanna mimic a, you know, a sand perch and swim it really slowly across the bottom or a crab, then I'm gonna fish this flare hawk, okay? Really an awesome jig, catches a lot of big snook. A lot of big snook and a lot of big redfish will crush this flare hawk.
Okay. Let's talk about seasons when it comes to pier fishing. You can go fish a pier 365 days a year, any day, and have success. However, the ideal season is right now, winter time. You know, the cold winter time is really when the pier fishing heats up. It really does, and especially as you go further north, as I mentioned, Lake Worth, Juneau, uh, you know, Sebastian, now is the time of the year when these guys are just crushing the fish on the piers. And big fish too, big bull redfish, a lot of redfish that are over slot size that you can't even keep, they're so big. Okay, how about black drum approaching 100 pounds? giant giant black drum and of course you can't keep those either and they, if you could they probably taste like a rubber tire right <laughs> but nevertheless doing battle with a 50 60 70 pound black drum off a pier is pretty exciting it really is big snook at night okay so right now is a great time to fish the piers a couple things that are really important when it comes to pier fishing we talked about where on the pier to fish you know, seasonal, like I said, winter time is an excellent time, but what about the tide? Okay, that's really important, the tide. Regardless if it's incoming or outgoing, both tides will produce as long as that water is moving. You've got to have moving water. If it's slack tide, everything just stays still. Okay, everything stays still. And the fish could be there, they're there but they're not eating, they're not in feed mode, okay? You gotta have that moving water. So the stronger the tide is, the more likely you are going to achieve success. There's so much more happening. Bait's moving, you know, it, 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 it's just that's alive. The whole area is alive. So you've gotta have a good, strong, moving tide. As far as conditions, you know, those days when it's flat calm and absolutely beautiful out, glass calm, I'm not going to fish a pier, okay, and you can, but don't expect to achieve any great level of success. Nasty. They like it when it's nasty and rough, okay, they really do. That's when these fish turn on inshore. The water is really well oxygenated, there's a lot happening, a lot of things are going on. So don't be afraid to go fish these piers when it's blowing 15 to 20 or 20 to 25. Listen, you're not going out on a boat, you're going on a pier. It's gonna cost you $2.50 to walk out there, which is another benefit of pier fishing, right? The affordability, you know, some piers are free, some piers, you know, five bucks, whatever. Okay, you can't beat that. So, and you know, fortunately too, I, I should have mentioned this earlier, we all know that they're building a whole new Pompano pier here, you know? So it's gonna be exciting in the future that there's gonna be a really nice pier locally. And while it may be a nice pier though, I don't think it's going to improve the fishing at the pier versus what it was. Because like I said, the further north you go, the more successful you're gonna be at the piers. Um, you know, make sure it's a moving tide. Time of day, you know, we all like to say early low light conditions at dawn and at dusk are certainly a great time to fish up here. But some of these fish are very finicky and they turn on and off like a light switch. They really do, especially stuff like the pompano. Okay, the pompano could be there, suddenly they'll turn on at five in the afternoon till seven in the evening and boom, like a light switch. They'll just completely shut off. Snook are the same way. Anybody here an avid snook fisherman? Okay, if you're not, I'm gonna tell you right now. Very, very finicky. Okay, they turn on and off like a light switch. And the only way for you to catch them is of course to be there at the right time, at the right place. So the more time and effort that you go and that you put into it, of course the more results that you're gonna see. A lot of these piers have webcams. A lot of these piers you can call and say, hey, what's going on? You know, and get a little bit, do a little bit of homework, do a little bit of research before you pack your truck and decide to drive to Jupiter. Okay, or Juno, or wherever it is that you're going. You know, don't be afraid to pick up that phone and call the guy. Now, of course, they're all gonna say the same thing. Oh, the bite's on fire. Okay, <laughs> really, what are they catching? Oh, they're catching pompanos and blues and blah, 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 blah. It's crazy how good it is. You better get down here right now. Okay, and you get over there. What's going on? You're like, what? You know, what is going on? You know, so you have to understand, you got to kind of take it with a, you know, grain of sand, so to speak. Um, but do some homework, really important. I can't stress enough, proper preparation. You know, you want to have the right gear, but keep it simple. Don't go out there with an entire 
tackle bag with all of this stuff that you're never going to use. Okay, only take what you need, but make sure that you have what you need and make sure that you have spares because again, very often you'll get cut off on your lures from the toothy critters, you know, you'll lose rigs from at the very least being tangled with other people. It's just part of the game. It really is. Um, but if you get dialed in and you put in the time, you could really have a lot of success at piers. Some people are so good at it. You know, truthfully, my brother and my nephews, my nephews are teenagers. And, you know, my brother's a little bit older than I am, but they are so into pier fishing and they're so good at it that it, it, it's unbelievable. You know, these kids spend every day every day at these piers. They know where the fish are, they know where they're gonna turn on, when they're gonna turn on, they know how to catch them. It's crazy, but there's a lot of opportunity there. Like I said, with a lot of different species, it's affordable, it's fun, and you can catch some great eating fish, you know, coming home with redfish or snook or pompano. These are some of the best eating fish that are out there. You know, whiting, uh, there's all sorts of different species that you can catch off the piers. So we've talked a bunch about that, and now we're gonna transition to the beach fishing, okay? Because this too is very technical, okay? It's not as simple as just walking down on the sand anywhere, throwing a bait out and catching a fish. You know, there's something about surf fishing that's really, really special. You know, somebody said to me earlier today, they said, Mike, you got a 30-something foot CV with triple 350s and a beach cart, okay? And a beach cart. And yeah, I do have a beach cart because I like surf fishing. You know, I grew up surf fishing up north for striped bass and bluefish. And, you know, my wife will tell you how many mornings we spent out there, you know, fishing the beach. There's something special about being barefoot, walking out on the beach, the sand between your toes, you know, not a lot of people, the waves are crashing. You know, it's just, you like look out at the water and look out at the horizon. You're like, this is my world right here, you know, and it doesn't matter what you catch. So there's a lot of benefits to the beach. You know, of course, the affordability, very much like the piers. You can get out on the beach, doesn't cost you anything. You've got to be careful with access because certainly you can't go behind Tiger Woods' house on the water, okay, and just start casting. And I don't even know if he lives on the water, but I'm assuming he does. You know, so access is certainly an issue, but there's plenty of places where you can access the beach here locally and again further north. And as I mentioned, the further north you go, the better off you're gonna be when it comes to surf fishing. When you walk down to the beach in whatever area, you're dragging your beach cart, which is essential, okay? I cannot stress this enough, because imagine walking hundreds of yards in the sand carrying all of this stuff and a cooler and you know a backpack with your gear you know it's just not feasible so it's really important to have that beach cart so when you walk down to the sand you can have a guy who's fishing right here catching nothing zero and you can have a guy who's 50 yards away who's catching fish after fish pompano after pompano black drum redfish all sorts of great you know great fish but he's only 50 yards away they're both fishing the same bait what is the difference between the two guys? Anybody? That's right. Okay, he's going like this. And what he's implying is the contours, okay? Look at the sand. You know, sand moves. It moves with the tide. It moves with the waves. And little cuts and channels are created where water is funneling in and out of that cut, in and out of those troughs, okay? So you've got to walk down, and before you decide to plant your feet right here, Okay, pay attention to what's going on and look for irregularities. And you'll see them, you know, you'll see where that wave is breaking just a little bit different than all of the rest. You'll see where that water is funneling out, you know, where there's a, a cut that's channeled in between two troughs. You can see these, these different distinctive areas. That's where I want to fish. Okay, that's where I'm gonna fish because that's a feeding channel. That's where bait is being funneled in and out of the beach, right through those cuts and over those troughs. So it's not as simple as just setting up anywhere. It's all about, well, I guess like a lot of things, location, location, location is very, very important. Location, location. So once you, you know, figure it out, hey, I wanna fish in this particular area right here, then again, you have to decide, am I going to fish bait? What am I targeting? What am I fishing for? And again, lots of different options, okay? 
if you are further north, you know, from this area, well, you know, let me kind of start in this area. If I was to go surf fishing here in Broward County, the only thing I would really expect to catch are snook and potentially some bluefish and Spanish mackerel moving up and down the beach, okay? Every now and then you may get a shot at a tarpon, but not very often, but you may, okay? There are some permit that cruise up and down the beach. There's a, a quiet, secretive little permit fishery going on in Broward County off the beach that not a lot of guys know about, and they're keeping it hush-hush. They go out there, they'll throw out their crabs, and they'll catch permit and bonefish, which, by the way, I'm not sure if you're aware that everybody, you know, associates bonefish with the Florida Keys and the flats, which is true, of course, that's where they are. It's a flat species. But there's a whole body of bonefish all up and down the beach. And once you get up to like, you know, uh, Lake Worth and even Boynton and North, a lot of bonefish being caught. Not a lot of big ones. It's rare that you'll see one over three to five pounds, but a lot of them. So it's nice to see them. You know, guys off the piers are catching them and guys off the beach are catching them as well. If you're going down to the beach, to meet fish, you know, you want to have a relaxing experience, you want to throw a few rods out in some sand spikes, okay, you guys all familiar with sand spikes that you stick into the sand that'll hold your rod. Keep in mind, another benefit to the beach cart is that it doubles as sand spikes. I can fish multiple rods, I can set this up sideways and fish one bait this way, one bait this way, and one bait this way, all from the same beach cart and not even use sand spikes. Um, but either way, you obviously need one or the, you know, one or the other. If you're going to fish bait, this, this is really the ideal best bait rig that you can possibly fish off the beach. The same bait rig that we talked about earlier, fishing off the pier. Pyramid sinker, okay, 20 or 30 pound fluorocarbon diamond presentation leader, small VMC circle hooks, 8 foot chaos rod, don't use any other rod or you won't catch anything. Has to be a chaos rod, okay? And whiz this out there with, again, either shrimp or sand fleas or crabs or, you know, or clams are ideal baits that you can easily purchase in advance or you can catch the sand fleas with a sand flea rake right at the beach. There's a lot of areas where you can catch live sand fleas right in the wash by raking them. If you're unfamiliar with how to do that, I'll, I'll tell you, you know, after the seminar exactly how to do that, but certainly you could acquire your own live bait or you can show up with fresh shrimp and, you know, whatever bait you do use, if you, and uh, certainly nothing against this or any other tackle shop, but if I go over there and open that freezer, there could very well be frozen bags of shrimp in that freezer, right? If I took that frozen shrimp put it on this hook, went down to the beach, and gave it all my might and chucked this out as far as I could, what's going to happen to that shrimp? It's going to fall off, okay? And if it doesn't fall off on the way out there, certainly once it's soaking in the water, it's gone. It's mush. It's garbage. Okay, it's garbage. Okay, so fresh. Think fresh is so important. Even if you have to buy live shrimp, and let them die, you know, either way. But again, fresh. I cannot stress this enough. This is not, this is a technical fishery, just like every other type of fishery, and bait plays such an important role. It's so crucial that the offerings that you're putting out there are, you know, as appealing as they could be. So just think fresh. If it's clams, if it's the shrimp, or if it's sand fleas, okay? Think fresh. Throw this out there, this is gonna anchor in the bottom. I've got a two hook rig. I can catch redfish, I can catch pompano, I can catch snook, anything and everything eats that kind of stuff when it's swimming in the surf, okay? Granted, I'm not looking for tarpon. I'm not looking for monster snook with this rig. That's not what it's designed for. As I mentioned, this is more about the relaxing meat fishing, trying to catch some fish to bring home, having a good time with kids and family members, you know, or even yourself trying to bend some rods. So it's a great rig to throw out there. And while this is out there, one, two, or three, or sometimes more, because I can tell you that there's a whole group of dedicated commercial pompano fishermen. Okay, they're commercial pompano fishermen, rod and reel fishermen. Without a commercial permit, I believe the limit is five pompano per person, if I remember right. With a commercial permit, I believe the limit is 200 pompano. 
Okay? And these guys are so good at this. They're dialed in. There's a whole network of guys, and they all talk to each other. And the guy from Juno is calling the guy in Jupiter who's calling the guy in Sebastian because they all benefit from each other by working as a team. And the guy says, hey, the bite's on over here, and he's going, the bite's not on over here. And again, that's where they all fish, and they all get dialed in, and they fish up and down the whole coast. And they will fish eight rods at a time. They'll line them up with two hook rigs and their specialty rods. These rods are 12 to 14 feet long with specialty type of conventional reels that have a super free spool that allows them to cast a rig further. You're like, where'd it go? Okay, where? I didn't even see it land, and I kid you not, because sometimes those pompano are not up on that first bar, the first trough, and sometimes they're not on the second trough. Sometimes they're way out beyond the third trough, and I can't get to them, and you can't get to them, but the commercial fisherman with a 14-foot rod who could whiz this thing 200, 300 yards, he's getting to them, okay? But the point is, these guys, again, they're fishing fresh bait, okay? They're fishing multiple rods, but where I was going with this is if you go out there and you throw out a baited rig or two or even three, I mean as many as you possibly can, you can then take another rod with a spoon or a swimming plug and you can walk the surf and fish for the bluefish and snook and other fish that are cruising up and down the surf with an artificial lure while you also have baited rods out there. So you can really maximize your time okay, and really try and catch everything you can. Now of course if the baited rigs are keeping you busy, then you're going to put that stuff down and away and you're going to focus on your baited rigs or vice versa. If you're not catching anything on bait, but you're only catching the bluefish and the mackerel on the jigs, then obviously you're going to focus on that. Okay? Simple rig, simple to tie. You can certainly buy pre-tied rigs, but as you can see, this is nothing more than a dropper with then two dropper loops, sinker tied on the bottom, not a lot of terminal gear, not a lot of fluff, not a lot of garbage. Okay, it's very stealthy. Okay, you can obviously just a little loop right on the sinker. You can switch the size of the sinker based on the conditions because a lot of times what's going to happen, you're going to take your rig, you're going to throw it way out in front of you and in three minutes, it's going to be over there. That ever happen to anybody? Oh, yeah. Right? In three minutes, it's over there. You need a heavier sinker. There's a lot of current, there's a lot of tide, there's a lot going on, you need a heavier sinker, you know, to try, and sometimes there's nothing you can do. There's so much movement, you can throw an eight ounce sinker out here and it's still gonna get, you know, swept all the way down the beach. So you gotta kinda play your cards right there. Couple other things you can do on the beach that are also real exciting. And this even you can do locally, I've had a lot of success doing this locally. You can bring a couple of light rods one rigged with a sabiki, and the same rod, just like this, very, very light, the same rod, okay, with a 30 or 40 pound diamond presentation fluorocarbon leader with that same small circle hook. And what you do is you take your sabiki rig and you flip it out there and you try and catch a little door jack or a little bait fish, okay, and as soon as you do, or pilchards, you know, there's all sorts of little bait that's swimming up and down the beach, especially down by the piers here locally, and then once you catch that bait, you're going to switch rods, you're going to put that right back in the rod holder, I'm going to grab my other rod that's already rigged and ready to go, because the longer I keep that bait out of the water, the more likely it is it's going to die, right? So I've got to move fast here, because right, I want to fish a live bait. I'm going to take that bait, hook it right through the nostrils on that circle hook, I'm going to flip it out there and I'm just going to swim it. I'm going to walk down the beach and just let that live bait just swim right down the beach. And it's a killer way to catch snook. Okay, great way to catch snook, a lot, a lot of fun. And, you know, again, make no mistake, do not think that that live bait needs to be on the other side of this shop here. It does not. It's right there. That's where these fish are. They're cruising right up and down the shoreline, okay, especially the snook. They're right there, right in that trough. It is extremely common to see the fish cruising right up and down the beach. So you don't have to, you know, cast a country mile. And that's why you can get away with a really light rod. Number one, you don't need a ton of line, okay, because you're only fishing right there. Okay, so I've got plenty of line capacity on here. And number two, I want a nice soft tip. Okay, a nice soft tip because I'm fishing a small little three inch live bait. Imagine trying to fish a three inch live bait on that, right? I mean, you wouldn't know what is going on. You would kill the bait. There's just too much tension, too much, 
you know, beef going on there, you'd end up killing the bait. So the lighter the rod is, the easier it is on the bait fish as well. The more lively the bait fish is, the more fish you're going to catch. Another thing you can do on the beach, which, you know, clearly I'm not rigged and ready for here, but there's this whole crowd of guys that are shark fishing on the beach and catching big sharks. I'm not talking about little sharks. I see you guys giggling because you guys are probably into that, right? Okay, 200, 300, 400, 500 pound sharks off the beach with these massive rods, massive reels. They're using, you know, kayaks or stand up paddle boards to paddle a live bait way out there, or not a live bait, but like a bonita or a big mullet, and they'll paddle it way out there, and they'll drop it in, and then they'll paddle back, and they'll fish off the beach. You know, or they'll use these slingshots, okay, these crazy big slingshots to chuck their bait out there. Some guys are using drones, okay, to pull the bait way out there, and they catch these massive sharks. And I'm not talking about sharks. I'm talking about jaws, okay? I mean, hammerheads, tiger sharks, all sorts of giant sharks. And they're even, not a lot of people know about this because they won't really talk about it, but a lot of these guys will catch these black tip sharks, okay? Little small spinners and black tips that are about four feet. And they will take that shark and they'll put a giant circle hook in it. And they will fish that shark live, okay, for giant hammerhead sharks and tiger sharks and bull sharks. Okay, so they will literally fish a shark on a hook like this, okay, for a bigger shark, okay, and they're catching them, they're doing this, all right, and again, not a lot of people are talking about this because, you know, you're fishing a live shark is certainly unethical, but that's to the extreme that some of these guys are taking this, this big time shark fishing. You know, and this not only happens here, it's all around the state of Florida. It's over in the Panhandle, it's on the West Coast. There are giant sharks that cruise our shorelines. You know, if people knew, people say to me, do you scuba dive or do you dive? I'm like, hell no. My feet are staying in the boat. I am not getting out of the boat. I know what lives out there. I've seen it. If you knew, you, I would never, I'm not going in the water. I'm not, I don't go to the beach and go swimming. I'll go in my pool. Okay, I refuse to go to the beach because I know what's cruising up and down the beach. And I'm not saying these are man eaters that are going to eat you, but still intimidating to know that there's a 500 pound tiger shark or a big bull shark that's cruising right there. We've all seen the videos, you know, we've all seen the stuff on, on, online there. And it's true, it's real. Big, big sharks. So again, you've got this crowd that are fishing for these sharks with big baits, and you also have the spinners and the black tip sharks that are migrating during the winter time. You know, we see it on Channel 7 News. They're like, whoa, shark migration off Florida, everybody out of the water. It happens every year, people. Okay, it's been happening for millions of years. Okay, but they're a lot of fun, and you can go catch these smaller black tips and spinner sharks that average 50 to 100 pounds, and you can easily catch them off the beach, even with stuff like this, with like poppers. Okay, super exciting because you'll see those sharks are cruising right in the shoreline. The same thing. You'll see them busting, you know, mullet pods. You'll see the birds diving, and you can throw big poppers at these sharks and catch them off the beach on this exact rod and reel, you know? So it's a lot of fun, and it's another, you know, it's, it's big game fishing from the sand. It really is. It's big game fishing from the sand. So not something that I'm super into, but you know, a lot of people are getting more and more into it, that whole shark fishery thing. So we've talked about, you know, the snook fishing off the beach and, you know, the bluefish where any morning, you know, any day, any evening, you can grab a rod with a swimming plug, a Rapala X wrap, something like that. You can go walk down to the beach with nothing more than one rod with a swimming plug and just walk the beach casting that plug and have a great opportunity of catching a nice snook or a few smaller snook and some other bycatch like bluefish and things to that nature. Or you can take it to the you know, next level and set yourself up with a whole arsenal and, and cast out multiple rods and reels with baits and target pretty much everything that swims by. You know, there's just north of Sebastian Inlet, just north of Sebastian, there are some We'll call them little, like, I don't want to say a resort, but they, they call themselves resorts. But the little single-story kind of hotel places that are right on the beach. 
that are really affordable. It's like 100 bucks a night, something like that, and you get this little studio. But what's cool about it is it's right on the beach. So you wake up in the morning, you walk right down to the beach, and you fish right there. And you can go right back to your room, and there's great fishing there. You know, when the bite's hot, there's times you can't fish two rods because one is constantly being bent over by a redfish, a black drum, a pompano, you know, a whiting, all sorts of really good eating fish. And then during the evenings, the bluefish come in and you have these bluefish blitzes. So lots of great opportunities that are affordable and a great, great getaway for the weekend you know, with an opportunity to catch some great eating fish. So a lot of different opportunities on the beach, but like I said earlier, it's not as simple as just going anywhere, planting your feet in the ground and, hey, I'm expecting to catch something. You know, pay attention to what's going on around you. Again, do some homework, pay attention to the tide because the same thing on the beach, they're gonna bite with the tide, okay? The water's gotta be moving. So we're gonna transition to really what probably could be the most technical of all three between pier fishing and beach fishing and that's the bridge fishing okay the bridge fishing there are a lot of great bridges really from here all the way on up the coast and certainly once you get up past boca like camino real from camino real north every single bridge holds fish Every single bridge in the intracoastal holds fish. Make no mistake, some will hold more fish on certain nights than other nights. Sometimes it'll be all big snook that are laid up on the bridge. Sometimes it'll be all little dinky snook, okay? All small fish that are, you know, shorts that are laid up. But they all hold fish. There are tarpon that are around the bridges because think about what a bridge is. Structure. Again, you've got this intracoastal, you've got the water that's flowing, may it be incoming or outgoing, okay, you've got, and then suddenly there's this giant structure that's going across the intracoastal, and usually it's a combination of concrete and wood, right, two primary forms of structure, and then on top of that, you have a shadow line at night. When you're fishing these bridges at night, you have that shadow line from all of the lights. So you have a combination of different factors all coming together to present this ideal form of structure right up and down the intracoastal. But to fish these bridges properly and effectively takes some skill. You know, it really does. It takes some skill and some specialized tackle, okay? Certainly anybody can go out on the bridge I can bring my awesome Zebco push button rod and my shrimp and I can drop it down and obviously anybody can do that. But what are you going to catch? Little grunts, little whatever, you know, you're not really going to catch anything. Little mangrove snappers, okay? And we're going to talk more about bridge fishing and snapper fishing in, you know, a couple more minutes. But around here and moving north, fishing these bridges is primarily about snook and redfish. There's a whole fishery that is developing from Boca, you know, in our area here, we're starting to see more and more redfish. More, we've never, you know, 10 years ago, catching a redfish in Boca, people would be like, what? You caught a what? What's a redfish? Not today, people. I'm telling you, you can go out here right now, daytime and nighttime, and fish all of these docks with live shrimp with a popping cork. Just take a live shrimp, put it on a circle hook, put it three feet under a popping cork. Throw it at the dock, drift that dock. You don't get a bite, go to the next dock. Drift that dock. You don't get a bite, go to the next dock. Drift that dock. And eventually you're gonna get a bite. And there are a lot of redfish showing up in our area, which is exciting because we certainly would appreciate a really good solid red fishery down here. It's not like what it is up north, okay? It's not like what it is in the Everglades or on the west coast, at least not yet, but a lot more are showing up year after year as the population of redfish explodes. You know, redfish is like a, uh, it's like the poster child of the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission. Red snapper or not, okay? Redfish are. They put these regulations in place that are so stringent that it's worked. It really has worked because there was a time when Chef Paul Perdome I don't know if you guys are familiar with it. He invented blackened redfish. And people were like, you did what? You took that fish, you put this seasoning on it, all you did was throw it in an iron skillet and it tastes like this, let's go kill every redfish. Okay, let's do it. And they did. 
and they went out and it was the biggest greatest thing and they killed almost every redfish and then these you know obviously laws were put into place to protect the species and now they've come back so strong so as the population continues to grow they have to continue to spread out and continue to find new territory and new forage so they're pushing south god bless you they're pushing their way south from the northern regions because the red fishery typically from Boynton North is certainly a lot better than it is down here. It's non-existent until, like I said, recently. So a lot of the guys that are fishing for the snook at night at bridges are catching the redfish at night as well. It's challenging to fish at night, I mean, I'm sorry, it's challenging to fish a bridge during the day effectively. Number one, you don't have the shadow line. Number two, you have a lot more traffic. And, and let me just, you know, I'm gonna pause for one second. Fishing bridges is dangerous. Seriously, I'm not kidding. People every year, anglers get killed fishing bridges. It just happened right by my house. A matter of months ago on Federal Highway, right down there, right south of Atlantic. You're all familiar with that bridge, just south of Atlantic on Federal. But a friend of my neighbors was snook fishing at night right off the bridge. And you know, when you're coming north, you're coming over that hill. You know, you don't see what's on the other side. Well, he was on the other side running across the bridge to fish the other side of the bridge. Car came over, and that was the end of that, okay? So certainly, you've got to be careful when you're fishing these bridges at night. A lot of bridges won't even let you fish there, you know? And some of them, you know, certainly it's at your own risk no matter what, but please exercise a level of caution when you're fishing bridges. So all of the bridges, like I said, all the way on up the coast, across the entire intracoastal, all hold fish and they're all snook magnets. They really are. And there are really two ways to fish these bridges for snook. One is with bait, okay? Obviously with bait. Well, what bait do I use? Did I just lose this? You guys still hear me okay? Okay, sounded a little funny there, sorry. Either A, mullet. Bingo, mullet. You cannot beat a live mullet when fishing a bridge because, again, it's the primary forage, okay? So you can bring a cast net. Often you can see the mullet swimming right next, you know, in the shadow lines or alongside of the bridge. And obviously some bridges are bigger than others and some have, you know, you can access the bridge from underneath the bridge. Other ones you have to fish the top of the bridge. So it's impossible, you know, to talk about every single bridge. But the point I'm making is you certainly can catch mullet right there on scene at the bridge. And that's a great bait to fish. You're simply gonna fish it on what's called a fish finder rig, an egg sinker, okay? A liter, approximately four to six feet of 40 or 50 pound diamond presentation fluorocarbon with a VMC 30 or 40 circle hook. That's your rig. Now understand if I am standing on the bridge right here, and well, we'll do it this way. If I'm standing on the bridge and I'm looking north and it's an outgoing tide and water's flowing this way and I'm looking north and if I took my mullet and my rig and I flipped it out this way, what's gonna happen? It's gonna get swept right under the bridge, right? Okay, and if I don't get tangled, it's just gonna be a nightmare any way you look at it. So when I'm fishing live bait off a bridge, I need to fish this way on that side of the bridge. Doesn't that make sense, okay? Plus, that's where the fish are. They're on that side of the bridge, some fish, right on the edge of that shadow line, waiting for this current, this tide, to flush bait under the bridge and out, you know, out to their waiting ambush spots. So the fish are there waiting. Again, I don't wanna take my mullet and throw it 100 feet away from the bridge, do I? No, because where's the snook? He's right there. He's right there at the bridge, okay? He's, ve or he's very, very close to it. So I'm gonna drop it straight down, literally straight down, and I wanna keep my mullet as close to that bridge abutment as I possibly can, because with the current and the tide, he's gonna get swept away anyway. And I'm slowly gonna feed it out. I wanna cover some ground, but once I'm way out away from the bridge, I'm reeling that up and I'm starting over again, okay? Another, if you cannot get mullet, Shrimp, again, you can't go wrong with shrimp. The only problem with live shrimp, you know, I don't know if this is a good problem or a bad problem, but the only problem with a big, fat, juicy live shrimp is everything eats it. Everything eats it. 
So it's tough to get that snook to bite if a little mangrove snapper's, you know, eating up your shrimp or a grunt or whatever it may be, you know, because everything eats them. So certainly a larger, hardier bait, you're going to have a much greater chance of catching a quality fish with a live mullet than you will with a live shrimp. Another option, especially as you continue to move north, that is killer, are ladyfish. Snook love ladyfish. You can take a sabiki rig, like that same sabiki rig, because keep in mind, same thing, I can roll my cart right up on that bridge, right next to the bridge, obviously depending on the access, I can have all of my gear ready to go. I can take my sabiki rod and you can tip those little hooks with a little piece of squid or a little piece of shrimp and you can drop it down and you can often catch those little like six inch ladyfish. Man, you put that on a circle hook rig, if there's any snook in a country mile, he's eating that sucker. Okay, they love those ladyfish, absolutely love them. Crabs, you can fish a crab, you can fish a live crab. You can drift a live crab with no weight. You just drop it down and let it drift with the current. Because remember that current sweeping down, those fish are on the backside. I'm gonna drop that live crab straight down in free spool and I'm gonna let them float out as naturally as possible. And again, what's gonna happen, that snook sees it, looks extremely natural and eats it up. So that's another option and you can get live crabs Atlantic Bait and Tackle locally here sells live crabs. They're not that hard to get your hands on if you can't get anything else. Another option when no crabs are available or no live bait or if you're just an artificial junkie who gets off on catching fish on fake lures like me, okay, because I'd rather catch one snook on a flare hawk than 10 snook on a live mullet, okay. This is the ultimate, ultimate lure for fishing for snook off of a bridge at night is that flare hawk. But there's a very big difference. Now with that current coming toward me, I am not fishing this this way. I am not casting it down current and reeling it back up toward me. Why? Because any bait fish or crab, they don't swim against the three, five, seven knot current. They swim with the current. Okay, they don't swim against it. So the proper way to fish this flare hawk, if the tide and the current are sweeping toward me, is I'm gonna cast it as far as I can this way. Let it sink and I'm going to retrieve it just slightly faster than that water's moving. Okay, and I'm just gonna slowly creep that right back to me on this side of the bridge, not on that side of the bridge. So it's important as to what side of the bridge you fish based on what bait you're fishing and what, you know, or if you're fishing an artificial lure versus a natural bait. Again, a lot of little details and nuances for bridge fishing. When you do catch a big snook, you know, there's sometimes, it's hard to get that fish up uh, onto the bridge. I mean, think about a 25 pound snook. Okay, you're not flipping a 25 pound snook, you're not. That's why a lot of times you'll see these guys that are fishing these bridges at night for snook, the, the serious snook fishermen, because there's a whole crowd of guys that are super snook fishermen. These guys are super dialed in and they're snook fishing aficionados. That's all I care about, you know, is snook, that nothing else. And you'll look at their equipment and you'll see they're fishing some pretty beefy rods, you know, some eight foot, sometimes nine foot conventional rods. They'll fish 50, sometimes 80 pound braid, heavy leader material, big flare hawk jigs, because they know they catch a big fish, they gotta stop them and they gotta get them up onto the bridge as well if they don't have a, you know, like a pier net or something like that. So it can be very challenging to fish those bridges for the snook, but certainly it could also be very rewarding as well. Another you know, thing about bridge fishing that I just want to touch on real quick, down in the Keys. There's so many bridges down in the Keys and it's a different world than here. When I talk about bridge fishing, I'm talking about you know, everything that we just discussed and not that you couldn't utilize a lot of these tactics in the Keys, but everything that we just discussed is from here north. Okay, that these are the tactics that guys are using from here north and the equipment that guys are using from here north. You go down to the Keys, it's a whole different world. Okay, fishing the bridges down there is not about catching snook. It's not about catching redfish or pompano. It's not about catching any of that. It's about catching snapper, okay, and, and groupers that are even swimming by the pier. 
tarpon. A lot of guys will catch tarpon off the bridges. You know, it's very challenging. You know, keep in mind with tarpon, for every 10 you hook, you're only going to land one anyway. That's first and foremost. And to land that one out of 10 off of a bridge, what are you going to do? Pull up a 100-pound tarpon? I mean, don't be stupid. You know, you're not. Certainly, there are a lot of bridges where you can walk down and have access, nec you know, have access next to the bridge. And it's an exciting fishery, and, and so many people, even like I was talking about my nephews that are really into bridge fishing, they get off on going down there and hooking these big tarpon off the bridges, knowing that the fight's going to end when it's right there. Okay, that success is the fact that they got it right there where they could see it, they've achieved success. Because they know well, they're not going to harvest it anyway, they're not going to kill it, they're not going to get it up on the bridge. So once it's right there, pop, done. Game over, let's catch another one. Okay, so there is that fishery as well. But a lot of people fish those Keys bridges for snapper, okay, which is great because especially this year, I'm going to tell you, since Hurricane Irma, the, the, the bottom fishing and the snapper fishing in the Keys is better than ever. Anybody down there will tell you that they are experiencing the best bottom fishing that they have had in many, many years. Incredible mutton snapper fishing, yellowtail snapper so thick that the entire water is just yellow behind the bow and they're limiting out like this, okay, and big fish. A lot of big mangrove snapper. It's just been an exceptional year and hopefully it continues. And the same thing at the bridges, you know, when you think about a lot of those bridges in the years past, you go there, you drop a shrimp in the water, you catch a yellowtail that's this big. Something that looks like it should be swimming around my aquarium, okay? Not today. Today they're catching flags. They're catching nice fish at the bridges. Really nice snapper. Fresh bait, certainly important, okay? And the best way to fish down there is you can catch that bait that's swimming around the pier with the same sabiki rig, okay, that we're talking about, or shrimp. Okay, obviously every tackle shop in the Keys with a jig head. Okay, all you gotta do is take a jig head, which I believe on the other wall here, they certainly have plenty of them in every size and color imaginable. Okay, and you base the size of the jig head on the current. If there's a lot of current and you're fishing deeper water, you may need a one ounce head. Okay, if there's not a lot of current, shallow water, you could get away with a quarter ounce jig head. So obviously having a variety of different size jig heads is certainly important. And that's all that you need is a jig head with a live shrimp. Drop it down and just slowly feed it out with the current. And that jig head will keep that shrimp toward the bottom and the snappers will eat it up. Some guys go to the extent where they take a chum bag and they'll drop it straight down. So they'll chum off the pier. There, you know, and you'll see these guys, like when you drive down to the, to the, you know, let's Key West as an example. As you're driving south, you'll see a lot of these bridges. There's some people that have tents set up on the bridge. They're there for the weekend, right? I mean, you've all seen it. They have got stoves and porta potties and they're like there. They're camping out on that bridge. They walked out like 800 yards out into the middle of the bridge and they're there. Those are the guys that are really, really serious about it, you know, and they will chum, literally, they'll chum right off that bridge. And of course, as that chum is flowing, all the snappers come in and they end up having a great experience. There's Goliath groupers that they, you know, catch at those bridges down in the Keys. Sharks, permit, they catch off the bridges with live crabs. A lot of good options down there. But it's a completely different fishery than we have from here north. You know, we just don't have those mutton snappers here. What we do have is certainly a lot of mangrove snapper, okay? We certainly can catch a lot of mangrove snapper, especially a Boynton Inlet, okay? Boynton Inlet is like a jetty slash pier, the north side. And when it's rough, really rough, like blowing 15 to 20, 20 to 25, all of the snapper come in shore. And you can go right there to that, to Boynton Inlet, and you can catch some really nice mangrove snappers with the occasional Cubera snapper mixed in as well. Okay, and I'm not, I don't mean a 50 pound, 80 pound Cubera snapper, but the five to eight pounders, the ones that look like giant mangrove snappers. So there's a whole snapper fishery that takes place at a lot of these inlets as well and it really peaks when it's rough. The same thing with the piers. The best fishing at Deerfield Pier is when it's really rough for the snapper, for mangroves and muttons. The muttons will move in there because when it's calm, they obviously go out to the reef lines and all of the wrecks, but when it's rough, they'll come shallower and you can catch them 
right off those piers there. So if you are going to pier fish, like I said, don't be afraid to go out there when it's nasty because that's really when you're going to experience some of the best, best fishing.